Morning. Please open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Bittersweet sermon as we finish the Sermon on the Mount. God willing, we'll be returning to the book of Genesis next week. Genesis 22. But this morning, we're going to finish where Jesus finishes. This is a very, very heavy passage. And so after we read it, we're going to pray because Jesus is going to be calling all of us to a decision this morning. And we're going to see that there is no via media. There is no middle way. You're either for Christ or you're against Christ. You're either living wisely in obedience to the word of God or you're living foolishly in disobedience. But let's read the text, and then we will unpack it. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears evil fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear evil fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. In this way, you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. And when he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. This is God's word. Let's pray for a blessing on its reading and for the Spirit to work in such a way that we do not leave here being hearers only of the word, thus deceiving ourselves. Father, we thank you for your word that brings about conviction, but also your word that brings about confession and conversion. Father, we ask, even in the words of Isaiah, that your word would not return to you empty, void, but it would accomplish its purpose. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would take the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and produce faith in the elect this morning. There may be some who have entered into this auditorium, into the gymnasium, who are moral, religious, even good in the eyes of many others, and yet dead in their sins. 
They have not received the promise of the new heart that Ezekiel promised would come. And Father, for people to leave here trying harder is to miss the point. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, would your sheep hear your voice? Would they not only hear you calling them, but would they follow? Would they obey? Would they bow their knee and call upon you this morning for the first time? Lord, Master, King. And Father, for us, who have come to know you in Christ, who have been born again to this living hope, would you remind us, Lord, that the path to which you've called us was never meant to be one of ease, was never meant to be one of comfort, but you would remind us, Lord, that the, the way, like the gate, is hard and narrow, that there will be persecution, there will be cost, but it will be worth it. When we see Jesus, would we even, Lord, by faith, believe what we just sang? To trust and obey is to find this happiness, this joy, this blessing of following King Jesus, whose commands are not burdensome. Father, would you help me now to preach the words of your Son, not only accurately, but with the anointing of the Holy Spirit? Father, we are convinced from the scriptures that it is never, ever going to be through the eloquence of a mere mortal man that one is brought from death to life, that one is born again from above. We know in the words of Paul that we require preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit, that we might put our hope not in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Father, would you work powerfully? We need a word in this season. Lord, in a world that is full of uncertainty, would we be reminded that there is certain truth that is unchanging? And Lord, would you even comfort our hearts with the reminder that you are building your kingdom, and not even COVID, and not even corrupt governments, not even a wicked world will hinder that. Would you reorient our minds to your kingdom afresh this morning, Father, and help us now to live in a way that honors you? Would you help us afresh to recommit ourselves to seeking first, above all other things, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, trusting you will give us everything we need, the very thing I'm asking for this morning, in this moment, Father. Be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have established through the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus is the ultimate lawgiver. He's about to descend the mountain that he ascended, and that's using language of Moses. God had gathered his covenant people in the Old Testament, and the prophet now was to explain and teach what it was like to live in the kingdom of God. However, like Moses and every other covenantal enforcer, Jesus, as the true prophet of God, is not merely content with offering a bunch of platitudes or religious cliches that we can put on bumper stickers and coffee mugs. He's not merely content that people are like, that would hashtag well on Facebook. You see, Jesus, like Moses, is issuing an ultimatum. And he's not merely content that our hearts have been filled with truths and facts. He's calling for a decision. It sounds almost reminiscent of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 30. The word is, is not far from you. The word from heaven has been brought down to earth through a prophet. And this word of exhortation ends with a word of decision. I have set before you, says Moses, life and death, blessing and and cursing, which will you choose? It's like Joshua at the end of Joshua, before he goes the way of all the earth, he reminds the listeners in the land, you have a way to choose. 
You can choose wisely or foolishly. As for me and me, my household, we're going to choose. It sounds like Elijah, the prophet who ascended the mountain with these vacillating Hebrews, idolaters, wanting to serve Yahweh and wanting to follow Baal at the same time. And he says, you cannot. You either choose Yahweh or choose Baal. There's no middle ground. Jesus is doing the same thing this morning. He's saying either build your life upon God and his word as evidenced and expressed in obedience or find yourself astonished when God casts you into hell. These are harsh words, but they're true words. And we'd be well reminded that if you are not in Christ this morning, you will leave here condemned. Well, how do you know that you're in Christ? Well, let's get to the text then. No conjunction. It doesn't say now or and. It does not say but. Jesus moves from the golden rule to get now you to make a decision. Enter. Enter. There is... A weightiness to this command. Go into, you could translate it. And there's nothing casual about it. You see, Jesus as God knows the holiness of God. And he knows the wrath of God. He is about to endure when he hangs on the cross. He alone understands the holiness of God. And the severity of God's judgment upon unrepentant sinners. And when he is saying, enter, imagine now. The one that we see smiling and and having children come into his presence and him blessing. And the one who is the friend of sinners, the shepherd of the sheep. See now the seriousness of him. I I don't want to get outside the text, but could you imagine his eyes when he himself, who knows the judgment of God that will fall upon every person in the world, when he says enter, he means it. This isn't an option C. This isn't something that he is casual about. So often, like many of us, myself included, when he says enter, he means it. Enter into life. Enter into the kingdom. Whenever he uses this verb, it's used in the context of not just entering into a church building or entering into a a moralistic kind of life or entering into kind of this religious experience. No, he's talking about entering into the kingdom of God, entering into eternal life. No decision could be more important to you this morning. If you find yourself an unbeliever this morning, this is the greatest decision. Not what kind of job will I get, not where will I live, not am I single, not will I be married, Not when will there be a vaccine, not should I do this, should I do that. Those are important. I get it. But they all pale and fall into insignificance when compared to this command. This is the only thing that matters for you this morning. I pray that God will put away all distractions. Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate. And we're going to see throughout. He's contrasting two ways. Two gates, two confessions, two trees, two fruits, two builders, two foundations. You can't find yourself in between this morning. You see, that's something the world enjoys, is being politically correct. I will follow Jesus, but I will also follow Black Lives Matter. You can't, they're incompatible. I will walk in the light and yet still mess around with the darkness. You can't. You you can't be in the narrow way and walking the wide way at the same time. There's an incompatibility. There is an exclusivity to Christ's kingdom. And we don't like to hear those words. But Jesus is saying, you're either with me or against me. You're either on your way to heaven or on your way to hell. I'm not saying this for effect. But this is the ultimate preacher concluding the ultimate sermon. Why would I deviate from that? Enter. By the narrow gate. Does the gate 
signify the entrance into the kingdom and conversion, or does it signify the entrance into God's ultimate presence at the last judgment? I don't know. Commentators differ on it, but I don't think it matters because he's saying the gate and the way are narrow. I am going to follow the word order, however, and start with the gate, believing that the gate is the way into the path. It's the picture of Pilgrim's Progress. It's a book I could not commend enough. You're going to get sick of me commending that book, but I will not stop. Before Christian, as it were, enters onto the path, he must enter through yonder wicket gate. And says, Jesus, this gate is narrow. This gate is not wide. There is an exclusivity to coming to Christ. That you cannot come to Christ being religious or moral or with your sin. It's narrow. And the illustration that I learned many years ago from John MacArthur that has never ever left my mind is the picture of entering a turnstile at the airport. You know those annoying little things that you always get caught up in? Or if you're carrying your, your, your bag at the, at the, well, in Toronto when we'd enter into the metro, you always get caught up. It's narrow. I can't come in with three people beside me. I can't come in with my backpack. I have to, as it were, strip everything off and enter in. It's restrictive. You can't carry your baggage in to the kingdom. What does it mean to enter the narrow gate? It's simply this, Christ alone. You can't enter into the kingdom saying Christ plus. You don't enter into the kingdom through all of your religious experiences or through all of your religious doings. When Jesus says the gate is narrow, he's not saying all roads lead to heaven. Now, all signs, of course, of every religion will say heaven. But only one of them actually is the way to heaven. I'll say it and not for effect. Islam is not the way to heaven. It's the way to hell. Roman Catholicism is not the way to heaven. It is the way to hell. Hinduism, Buddhism, Mormonism, all the isms, they say heaven. But they end up in hell. Let me apply this quick. This is why it's hard to follow Jesus. Because you know darn well that when you tell your well-meaning neighbor, who's a religious Mormon, that he's following the wide way, and he's not in the narrow gate, and that he's on his way to hell, that he's not going to appreciate that. So when you're sharing the gospel with them, when you're sharing the gospel with your children, let them know there's not a multitude of ways. There's one gate and it's not wide. It's one gate and it's narrow. Jesus does not allow us to come into the kingdom without repentance. That's what John preached. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus echoed those same words. He didn't de deviate from them. Would you enter into eternal life this morning, O oh, unbeliever? I'm not offering you a whole bunch of ways, and I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying you will need to turn from your sins, those cherished sins you want to hold on to. You either let them go, or you perish in them. It's as simple as that. Now, I'm not claiming you must be perfect, but you must be willing to part with your darling sin. Jesus does not share his bed with whores. Enter the narrow gate. Why? For the gate is wide and the way is easy, or I translated broad, that leads to destruction. What kind of destruction? That's eternal destruction. Jesus is talking about eternal matters this morning. That's that Greek word apolia. Not just destruction and annihilationism, but destruction of body and soul forever in the torments of hell. Note that he says that the way to hell, it's wide. It's wide. 
This is the multitudes coming in easily. The floodgates to hell are open. There's no restriction. There's no turnstile. There's no restrictions. You, you want to accept Jesus into your heart without repenting? Hey, just understand Jesus says that's the broad way. It's the easy way. And it leads to hell. It, it does remind me at the very last scene almost in the Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, of this guy who thought he could enter up into the, the mountain the easy way. And he plunges into eternal perdition. Right? It, it says here's the way to heaven and he believed it. And he never heeded Christian's warnings. Did you enter in through the narrow gate? No. Well then you're not on the way to heaven. You're on the way to hell. Those who enter by it are many. Do not be surprised when so many of the people you work with reject the gospel. So many of your neighbors reject the gospel. But do not tailor make the message to try to appeal to the many who are on the Broadway. Tell them if you would enter into life you must enter in the narrow way, the way that is characterized by hardships and persecution. But let me stop here for a second. This is why you must believe in the doctrine of regeneration preceding the doctrine of justification. Because only someone who has a new heart will realize that it's worth following Jesus no matter the cost. You see, the carnal mind is at enmity to God and his ways. The Bible says that the, the natural mind regards Christ and his cross as foolishness. You want me to give up everything for the kingdom of heaven? The only person who would ever make that exchange is someone who has been granted the new heart. Obedience is never meant to be easy, which is why Ezekiel promised a new heart. Read it, Ezekiel 11, 18 and following. Ezekiel 36, 26 and following. Read it in Jeremiah 31. The law that the natural heart hates is an impossibility for it. When Jesus says, come to me and put everything else aside and bow your knee and come to me as Lord. There's only one kind of person who will do that and that is the regenerate. That has been born again, been born from above. This is foolishness to Nicodemus. This is foolishness to those in John 6 who say, this is a harsh word. But Peter, who has been born again, would say, where else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life and it's worth it. I will take up that cross because by faith I, bel I believe that the kingdom of heaven is worth all the scoffings and scornings of man. Do not think that you can trick somebody into making that decision. Dead people hate Christ. Dead people reject Christ. Even if they sit in churches. Even if they get baptized and go through confirmation. Even if they go through all of the religious dogma that a church is more than glad to pose upon them. You must be born again. This is foolishness. Why in the world would you ever enter a way that is hard? Unless you believe Jesus' words. Verse 14. For the gate is narrow. And the way is hard. That word hard has the idea in the background of persecution. That's why a lot of people will not ultimately persevere. Again, Pilgrim's Progress. The first two characters that Pilgrim meets as he's making his way to the celestial city are obstinate and pliable. Remember Mr. Pliable? I like the idea of heaven. I like this. Streets of gold. Tell me more, Christian. I, I love these flowery beds of ease. Will I be healthy and wealthy and live my best life now? Yes, yet no. Right away they fall into the slew of despond. And oh, pliable, with the wicked, reprobate heart of his. He's not helping Christian. He's like, I'm out of here. 
He says, if the way is like this at the beginning, how much more is it going to be at the end? You can take this Jesus thing and go on your way, Christian. I'm going back to the city of destruction. And many there are who, like pliable, with their unregenerate hearts, gladly choose that. Parents, are you praying for God to give your children a new heart? That's the number one thing you should be praying. Not, oh, that you would give them a, 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 a degree that is, has notoriety in the world, or that you would make them beautiful or popular. Pray that God would give them a new heart, that they would follow Jesus no matter the cost. And do understand the cost is not cheap. Are you saved by works? Absolutely not. You say by faith alone, but understand that this faith alone will manifest itself through trials and fruit. If you want an easy way to heaven, Christianity is not for you. You can go and become religious, and you will not have to deny yourself. You can accomplish a few religious feats and then end up hearing those treacherous words, I never knew you. Would you enter the way to life? You must enter through repentance in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, these are words you don't hear in a lot of churches. And I'm not trying to castigate them, but it's just the truth. Either the word of God is the word of God or it is not. And if it is the word of God, these severe words are true and we must take them to heart. The gate is narrow. And the way is hard or the way... It has all kinds of agitations and it's difficult that leads to the life. Not just any life. Literally, the life. Eternal life. And those who find it are few. To which I would ask, have you found it? Have you found the way to life? I'm not content that you're like, oh, Ryan said that there's a definite article, so it's eternal life. That's great that you know that Jesus is talking about eternal life. Have you found it? Well, we move from that contrast between two ways and two gates to a tree and fruit. There are two trees with two corresponding kinds of fruits. Again, no conjunction. Enter command. Beware, command number two. Do understand that false prophets have always been seeking to derail the kingdom of God. This isn't a new phenomenon when Jesus enters the scene in the New Testament. There have always been false prophets. And what has always characterized their message? Peace, peace. When there is no peace. That's the mark of a false prophet. He's an ear tickler. You can worship Yahweh. And you can also live for money and sex and ease and comfort. You can be worldly and a Christian at the same time. That reeks a false prophet. He says it in the present tense, which means what? Continue to be on your guard. Continue to be mindful. Be bewaring. Of false prophets. This is why Jesus said last time, when we were at the beginning of Matthew 7, that we are not to be hypercritical on the one hand, but also not un or acritical on the other. Why? You need to use your moral faculties to be able to discern is this person not only teaching rightly, but are they living rightly? You need to be able to distinguish between a false teacher and a true teacher. A false prophet and a legitimate prophet. But he says, beware. So church, beware. Read the New Testament. I would encourage you to read the New Testament, especially the epistles or letters, and take note of how many of them deal primarily with false teaching that has been introduced into the church through false teachers. I think of Galatians 2. It comes to mind. <laughs> These people crept in unawares. False brothers, he says. Who have come in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ. Anathema be to them. Jude came to mind. All of these people. They sit at your communion tables and your love feasts. And their blots and blemishes. 
who promote and allow lasciviousness within the church. They say it's all right to be ungodly and not to repent of your sins. It's okay. Have you raised your hand? Have you prayed the prayer? Have you accepted Jesus into your heart? None of which are biblical. That's what it looks like today. Beware of them. And yet many of us walk around in life with our Bibles closed. You will know them. Now they wear the garb of the Christian, but if you're around them enough, you'll smell the stink of a wolf. 1 Timothy 5, speaking of elders, but still broadened to be applied to all, Paul says to Timothy, be careful. Don't be hasty in laying your hands on an elder. Mark their life. Why? Because eventually you will see what is conspicuous, right? Either they're good, which shows their heart has been made good by the grace of God, or they're evil and unregenerate. You can't hide ultimately forever a person's heart. It will betray itself in word and in deed. Right? You never see the false prophet coming in with the hat, beware, I hate Jesus. Beware, I've entered in to feast on the flock. Right? Paul warns the Ephesian elders, remember? They come out to meet him in Miletus, and he's pleading with them, be careful, after I depart, pussycats are going to come in and purr around you. No, fierce wolves seeking to draw disciples after themselves. Preaching a gospel that sounds accurate, but it's from the pit of hell. So how do you know false? Well, yes, you need to know your doctrine, but you also need to remember Jesus' words. Out of the heart, the life will reveal itself. Or as he says here, you will recognize them by their fruits. This is very simple. You don't need to have a PhD to understand the metaphors Jesus is using. He's going to talk about trees. So I have apple trees in my yard. Guess what Ryan should expect from an apple tree? Wait, did you study botany and did you get out? Did you understand all? The, I don't need to know genetics. That's an apple tree. How do I know that I wasn't duped at the, uh, at the store where I bought the tree? Hey, in August, apples. That's what Jesus says. Eventually, an apple tree will bear apples, right? It might not look like it in March, April, May, June, right? They're just leaves. But eventually, I will know if that's an apple tree by its fruit. Are grapes, and, and the Greek implies a negative answer. Surely not, is how you could translate it, right? Surely not, grapes are gathered from thorn bursts. Of course not. If I want grapes, I don't see the sign, oh, thorn bushes, let's go get some grapes here. That's insane. Or he says here, you don't go to get figs from thistles. I hate thistles. I love figs. My family doesn't like figs. I like figs. When we buy figs, I eat them all. But I don't go and say, oh, here's a package of thorns and thistles. I can't wait to slam them into my face. No. I, no, like, it's so simple that we almost... You want good fruit, it comes from a good tree. If that tree is not bearing good fruit, it's not a good tree. It's as simple as that. You will recognize them. You will know them by their fruits. So in the same way, every healthy tree, every good tree bears good fruit. But the rotten tree bears evil fruit. Eventually it will come out. Which is why I believe false teachers don't like people being in their lives. They're like showing up on a Sunday or they're like leading a little group for a bit. But if you're around them enough, they will betray themselves. Just like false Christians will as well. They don't mind saying all the right things on a Sunday morning when they've cleaned themselves up. But at the heart of the matter, they've never been born again. And therefore, their fruit ultimately is bad or evil. Listen again to the king, verse 19. Every tree, every tree that does not make, do, or as the ESV translates, bear 
good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What do you mean, Jesus? The same fire that John the Baptist talked about. The hell of fire. Don't scare me. If I am, that's okay because Jesus seems content to talk about hell a lot more than pastors do. You're not bearing good fruit, you will be cut down. It's as simple as that. To which I would say in the language of Hebrews chapter 4, today then if you hear his voice, why would you harden your heart further? You've heard the summons of Christ to repent and to believe. Why would you reject it? Knowing that this is the end of all who reject it. This is the end of all whose hearts have never been born again. All whose hearts are naturally heart, uh, uh, hard, or naturally rotten. It doesn't say most trees. Every tree. But my neighbor's really religious. He's a good person. He just doesn't believe in Jesus and he will not repent. I don't know what else I can say. Amen. Like, this is hard. I get it. I, 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 but when Jesus says this, every, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Children, this is for you. Yeah, but my mom's a Christian. Well, then she's not going to be cut down because she's in Christ. Are you in Christ? I'm only five. You too can repent. And if you don't, irrespective of your age, you will be cut down. In the same way you can recognize false teachers, false prophets, and false, false converts by their fruits. Let me apply this quick before I move on. I always have the propensity to to not apply because I get to the end of the sermon and it's gone on so long that I wrap it up without application. How do you share the gospel with people? Do you say Jesus Christ alone is the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to the Father except through him? That there is no name given among men under heaven by which you must be saved. Do you say that? This is the exclusivity of Christ. And if you are not born again, you will be judged. Remember Nicodemus, Mr. Flattery King? Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one can do these signs unless God be with them. You must be born again, Nicodemus. What? Don't you know I am the teacher? She says, I know you are the teacher, and you're still blind. All of your credentials, all of your seminary training, all of your fancy flowery oratory to the Jews of religious things mean nothing because your heart is still dead. It's still in sin. It's still dead in sin. Nicodemus, if you're not born again, you will be cut down and thrown into the fire irrespective of your religious credentials. Well, let's move on from the two paths and the two ways and the two trees and the two fruits to the two confessions. Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And there is some continuity between the sections of verse 15 to 19 and verse 21 is the false teachers probably have duped these false converts. When it says you know a tree by its fruit, it can also mean you will know a teacher by his disciples. And so this false prophet is preaching a false gospel and the false converts have falsely believed it. Right? Why do they think that they're going to heaven? Because of excitement. Because the false teachers they follow have been propagating such damnable heresies. I'm going to heaven because I go to a church that speaks in tongues or they do miracles. I'm not getting into whether those are legit or not. That's not the basis by which you enter the kingdom. Lots of people love excitement in churches. Right? We could get a, a, a show going and Charles could, could get you riled up. But that's not the measure or metric by which one enters the kingdom. It's not how, 
How exciting was the experience? There's a lot of people who love going to exciting churches that never preach the necessity of the new birth. And those people who go to such churches never hear the gospel, and they are shocked. And they stand before the spotless, holy king of kings, and he says, I never knew you. Yeah, but we had lots of fun. Don't you remember me jumping with my hands in the air? And I'm not against that. Look at the way I'm preaching. I could give another preacher a run for his money and bringing jets down onto a runway. It's not that, but if you limit conversion to some kind of religious experience, you're deceived. It's as simple as that. I don't want to get into it. I'm not going to start trashing these things. But these people actually believe that they did certain things that were spiritual. And therefore, Jesus should let them in. No, your heart is still wicked. You don't need a new heart to be impressed by all kinds of ecstatic experiences. Not everyone who says to me. It's emphatic if you compare that with verse 19. Same Greek word. Everyone like this will be cut down. Not everyone is really the way they think they are. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. This is a picture of the final judgment. People standing before Christ, who is coming, by the way, to judge the living and the dead. Acts 17, God has appointed a man whom he has raised from the dead to judge everyone in this room, myself included. Lord, Lord. So they have this idea of who Jesus is, but they've never really understood his claims to being Lord. Let me give you one of my favorite verses in John 6, 46. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? And do not do what I say. You give all the lip service, but there's no corresponding action to that lip service. It's a facade. Who is the one who will enter the kingdom of heaven? The one who does. Same Greek word as bearing fruit, poiao. Over and over and over and over, Matthew is reminding us that the ultimate arbiter between entering and not entering is the one who does the will of God, the one who bears or does fruit. Religious experience is not the fruit, is not the will of God. Obedience to the king is... The one who does the will of my father is the one who will enter the kingdom of heaven. Listen, verse 22. On that day, many. You remember the Broadway? Many are on it. These are not all atheists. These are people who sit in Christian congregations. And I don't know why I'm not preaching this with tears flowing down my eyes. Because this could be some of you. Pastor, you always talked about election and justification and regeneration. Hey, that's fine. Talked about the lordship of Christ. Talked about all of his offices and really unpacked the truth. That's fine. Has it affected and changed your life at a heart level so that you follow this king and obey what he says? Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, in your name did we not prophesy. In your name did we not cast out demons. In your name did we not do many mighty miracles. Go and read the book of Acts. These three things are carried out by unbelievers as well as believers. Read the book of Revelation. Unbelievers in God's eternal purposes can be permitted even to deceive others with what? Signs and wonders. Now, by God's grace, the elect will not be deceived, but... That is what they are seeking to do, is to get people off of Christ and his sufficiency and to get them excited for all kinds of things that are not Jesus. I never forget, it comes to mind just now, and since I have no filter on my mouth and uh, very little space between my mind and my mouth, a fellow came to our church. He says, is it a spirit-filled church? I knew exactly what he was getting at. I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? Do you speak in tongues? I said, well, no, but that's not the mark of a spirit-filled church. You know what the mark of a spirit-filled church is? 
Jesus Christ being magnified through his word, being believed on. See, that's what the Holy Spirit has come to do, not to wow us with miracles, but to just wow us with the beauty of Christ. There's lots of people like this fellow who three months later I got a call, he's in jail. I'm not not saying Christian, but this guy's not a believer. He wants religious experience. He does not want Christ. He does not want holiness. He does not want fruit. He does not want to seek right living for the glory of God. He wants an experience. You don't need to be born again to want an experience. You can get that in Zen Buddhism. Right? But Jesus says this is so much different. Listen to the words of the judge. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Of course Jesus knows everyone. He's God. But this is this idea going back to the book of Genesis. Adam knew his wife. It's it's a covenantal intimacy. It's a knowledge. Of course Jesus knows about you. That's why he's judging them. But there was never, ever a relationship at a heart level. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who are doing lawlessness. That word again, poya out, to do. You doers, literally, of lawlessness. Remember, Jesus hasn't come to abolish the law of the prophets. Why? Because people will be judged by their law breaking. To which I would ask you, when you hear about the law of Christ, is it something that is distasteful to you? Or is it something that you say, I want to obey it? See, that's the mark of someone who's born again and someone who is not. I want to honor my king. That's what 1 John 5, 3 says. We're born again, yes, because we say that Jesus is Lord. We love him because we're born again. I get it. And the very next verse says that that being born again and that professed love for Christ manifests itself in what? Obedience. No, it, it does. That's just what the Bible says. It's as simple as that. People who work lawlessness will be judged and they will be commanded to depart. Well, let's get to our last contrasting metaphor that Jesus gives to us. Everyone then who hears these words, therefore, that's the first word in verse 24, therefore, In light of the fact that there are deceived people who will be sent to hell, listen up. Are you deceived this morning? Oh, I sit in a Reformed Baptist church and the sermons are like way too long, but I endure them because I'm a good... You might be deceived this morning. Hell is full of Calvinists. It's full of Orthodox people who said all the right things. They retweeted all the right posts. They hashtagged on Facebook all the right quotes from Spurgeon and Calvin. And that's great. Keep doing it. But please understand that is not what makes you a Christian. Therefore, in light of the severity of of judgment, listen to these words. Everyone who hears these words of mind and who does them there's that word poyao who does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock he's going to compare two people building their house on two foundations do understand that from a distance these two people look very similar and what differentiates them is the foundation they're building on, which is not always so easily discernible at first glance. If you're with them enough, you'll realize that house is kind of slanting a bit. But to the naked eye that is untrained, we might say that these men look the same from a distance, and even their houses might, but the foundation is what makes all the difference. So here's the wise man. He builds his house on the the rock. What is the rock? It's Jesus. Yes, but not in this passage. Jesus is the rock. I get it. Build your life on Jesus. But in this metaphor here, in this parable, you could say, 
Jesus says building your house on the rock is to be equated with doing the will of God. Doing! Okay? The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew, and they beat on that house, but it did not fall. And in Luke's parable, it says, because he dug deep. See, this is hard. You think being Christian is being easy? Now, God gives you the grace to do what he commands. I get it. But repenting is not easy. Asking someone to forgive you is not easy. Putting to death sin is not easy. Getting rid of things that will hinder me is not easy. And so here's this guy, he hears Jesus. Jesus is wrapping it all up. Hopefully I am too. But Jesus is wrapping it all up. He says, you've heard everything I've said. You've heard my, uh, my beatitudes. You've heard about my understanding of the law. You've understood what it looks like to live as a community. And it all means nothing if you don't do it. The storm came. What is the storm referring to? The old guys would say it's the trials of life, to which I would give a little bit of agreement to. But this whole time, Jesus has been talking about eschatological, or the real way of saying end time judgment. If you read the prophets, it's in Isaiah and Jeremiah, and especially in Ezekiel, they liken end time judgment to a coming flood, a coming storm. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Now, the temporary storms and trials of life can expose those things. Right? We see that in the parable in Matthew 13. Those who receive the word gladly, yes, I love the health, wealth, prosperity gospel until they get cancer. And then they want nothing to do with this Jesus. I get it. So those storms reveal the heart. But Jesus is not talking about trials. He's talking about judgment. There will be a storm that every one of us will experience, as it were. Every single one of us will stand before God on Judgment Day. It's not a matter of, of, of if, but when. Same storm hits both guys, hits both houses. Right? One, God doesn't lighten up. Ah, No, it's the, same, it's the same storm, the same wind, the same floods, the same beating upon. One survives, one does not. What's the difference? One has been born again and belongs to Christ. The other has merely just had a sham religion, fake, counterfeit. To which I would be completely obtuse not to think that there could be some people here who have all the right slogans and say all the right things, and yet in their heart of hearts despise obeying Christ's commands. But they do it because of maybe their cultural upbringing or the circle of influence they find themselves in. And they would never leave the church because they love the applause of men. And it's just the way uh, they've been brought up and that's just who they hang out with. And so will they just fake it till they make it? I would be just a complete dunce if I didn't think there could be that possibility of someone that here this morning who's not born again but needs to be. So he survives it by the grace of God. He proves that he belongs to Christ by a life characterized by fruit or obedience. Verse 26, this contrasts the wise builder with the foolish builder. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man. There's that word moro. We saw that in chapter 5. He will be like a fool. He built, but he built on sand. What a tragedy. They, all of their expenses, houses are not cheap. They take a lot of work. And it's all for nothing. He's building and he's building and he's building and it's all for nothing. End time judgment will wipe away all that he's put his life into. What a tragedy. That's actually more tragic to me than the atheist who completely rejects and he doesn't come to church on Sundays. He doesn't try to, you know, fake it by giving money here and there. That's tragic. I get it. This is even more tragic. Like the man of Hebrews 6. They sit under the preaching of the word. They see the spirit at work and yet they remain hard in their rejection. They are obstinate and recalcitrant. They refuse to bow their knee. They say the right things, but ultimately they don't obey Christ because they don't know Christ because 
they've never been born again. The same rain fell, the same floods came, the same winds blew, the same uh, three beat against that house, and it fell. And what was its fall? Great. Tragic was its fall. How much I would have to hate you and how much you would have to hate your neighbor if you're a Christian to not tell them this. Right? Is this true or not? You, you have to say if you're a Christian, this is true. It's true of your neighbors, it's true of your co-workers, it's true of your children. So what's their response? They were astonished. But that's not s sufficient. They must follow, and that's why I read Matthew 8, 1. And so now, the moment of decision is upon you. And if you're an unbeliever, I hope you feel uncomfortable right now. But you know what the thing is? I could look you all in the eye and I wouldn't know. But God does. God knows if you're an unbeliever. And I pray that God is working on your heart and you will say, okay, today is the day I put aside all of my false previous professions and I ask God to forgive me. I repent of my sins and I say, Jesus, you're my king. My allegiance is not half to you. It's all to you. That's what it means to be saved, to come to Jesus Christ as Lord, that he is the king. He is who he says he is. And as Lord, he has the sovereign prerogative to command how we are to live. That he has the sovereign prerogative to define what blessing is. And so you repent of your sins. And the Bible says all that come to Christ, all those that the Father draws to Christ, he will never cast away. But what does it look like to come to Christ? To enter through the narrow gate of repentance. Repentance is a gift of God that he gives to the elect in regeneration. Parents, pray that. Pray that when the preaching of the word happens, whether for family devotions or on Sunday or wherever they hear it, pray that God will grant them that repentance. Pray that God will grant them faith to say Jesus is worth it. I've found this treasure. For the first time I've seen its beauty and I give up everything for it. That's Matthew 13. The sun can beat against me, that's okay, because there's a true root that goes down deep and it bears fruit 30 and 60 and God willing 100 fold. I pray that you will not be like those that James is writing about. Go and read the, uh, the letter written by James. It's a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, do not be hearers of the word only. See, this has been a pretty serious sermon, hasn't it? Admit it, right? It's pretty heavy. I've tried to make it heavy. You know, it's a tragedy. There is a probability that unbelievers will still leave here, not acting upon it. Jesus commands all people everywhere to repent. I don't know what all where, all where, all people everywhere means to you, but it really means all people everywhere to me, to include you. Are you building on a foolish foundation? Are you building on sand? I guarantee this. You will come to recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I put it in my, I text myself. I pray that God, in his mercy, will expose our false foundations this morning. And not on judgment day when there's no hope of turning back. It is appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the second chance is no. After that, the judgment. God is offering a second chance to false converts here this morning. So let's apply this. How are you sharing the gospel? No, you don't need to be morose and negative like me. You know, curl up your face like a bulldog. And... But tell them it's Christ alone or Christ not at all. There's no wiggle room. It's not broad. You guys are so non-inclusive. Absolutely. Be very careful then of seeking to elicit a temporary response. How do you know someone has been born again? You will know them by their profession. Absolutely not. You will know them by their fruit, which is why it's so dangerous, even by the most well-meaning of Christians, to have some kind of evangelistic campaign and say, eight people were saved this morning. How do you know that? 
when Whitfield came to the eastern seaboard and revivals broke out, how many, because we love numbers, how many people got saved? I don't know. We'll find out how many people have committed themselves to church. And we'll count in five years from now. Not just because people got excited and raised their hands. Like at a country barnyard dance. It happened just a couple weeks ago. People were sharing the gospel on the street. Guy made a profession. Oh, praise God that he's born again. And I don't want to be Mr. Critical, so I didn't say anything. But I'm like, this is not good. I asked how the guy is doing a couple weeks later. Worse than ever. You just told him he's saved. That is dangerous. If you care about his soul, tell him. You need to enter through the narrow gate. And we will find out through trials and tribulation if this is legit. Do you know people who are living contradictory to Christianity and still think they're Christians? Tell them. Your fruit is not consistent with Matthew 7. How can we let people go on living years of disobedience, not doing what Jesus says? And still say, well, they're trying, or at least in their heart, they say they love Jesus. Jesus says three times in Matthew 4, in John 14, once in, Ma in John 15, if you love me, you will what? Keep my commands. Oh, don't let disobedient professors think they're on the narrow way. That's the broad way of allowing them to determine who God accepts. Jesus says, no, 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 no. Take up your cross. When you feel like it, no, take up your cross daily. Deny yourself. But it's so hard. That's why Jesus says in Luke 14, count the cost. Which is why, as a committed Calvinist, I leave this to God. Because some of you are going to be so angry. That's okay. I pray that you will be so angered that you are humbled to repentance. Rather than thinking that you're on your way to heaven when you have no fruit whatsoever. That's the cruelest thing a Christian can do, is watch somebody live a false life and not tell them to repent. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So where are you at? Two people know your heart. You and God. I don't. These sermons I look around, I always feel bad because people probably think I'm judging them. I'm not. I'm just trying to make eye contact so you don't fall asleep. That's why I'm looking at Charles all the time. You know. Right? And if today is that day, call upon the name of the Lord. He'll save you. He'll save you. If you do find it, oh, that you would enter and strive to enter the narrow way. Father, we thank you for the gospel. And Lord, we are reminded that it's not our works, but Christ's alone. But Father, we also know what James says, that faith without works is no faith. That faith without works is dead. And that even the works complete the faith. That, the, that they're not an optional component to saving faith. And so Father, I, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit we would make it our aim to increasingly become hungry and thirsty, to do what is right, because you have given us a new heart. And Father, for those who find this whole Christian thing so burdensome, so taxing, so, so ugly, Lord, I pray that you would work in their heart, because we love to do what we love. And so Father, I pray, would you help us to love King Jesus more? Would you help us to see his beauty, to see that he is the fairest king there is, that he is the most lovely, the most beautiful, and that we would gladly follow him because we know he has our best interests in mind. And that even when he's harsh here at the end of his sermon, that he is so because he knows the truth and he loves the people. Father, I pray even that this morning we wouldn't leave here thinking, uh, the pastor was, was angry. I, I pray that our neighbors would not think that we're angry because we tell them that we're either on the way to life or the way to death. But there are many ways that seem right to a man, but their ends all lead to death. Help us, Lord, by faith to hold on to the gospel and help us by faith to preach the exclusive gospel. 
the only one that saves, the only one that leads to life. And Father, I pray if there's any here this morning who do not know Christ through rebirth, through regeneration, that today would be the day. And Father, for those who leave still unconverted, have mercy on them, and would you send people into their paths to tell them to turn away from the broad way and to enter the narrow way. I pray for our children. Oh, I wish they would all be born again this morning. And if they are not, help us as parents, help us as a covenant community to direct them back to Jesus, echoing and issuing the words of Matthew 7 afresh for them. Oh, Father, would we follow your son this morning and that we would be fruitful for him and his glory, we ask in his name. Amen.